Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. It's Bullseye. Have you seen The Righteous Gemstones? It's a comedy on HBO. It is about a family called The Gemstones. They're pastors and owners of a massive megachurch with hundreds of thousands of followers. The family centers around Dr. Eli Gemstone, the patriarch. He's been preaching on TV for decades. It's played by John Goodman. But the show centers on Eli's kids, their power struggles, their scheming, their scandals, their ham-fisted attempts to curry favor with their father. Maybe think Succession, but if Succession was set in the South and created by Danny McBride, well, I mean, it, it actually literally is uh, created by Danny McBride, not just gemstones. Danny stars as Jesse, the oldest child. He is a boorish, overconfident dummy who constantly finds himself in over his head. So pretty much every Danny McBride character ever. There's Kelvin, the cool young one who dresses pretty much exclusively in affliction t-shirts, ripped jeans, and patterned sport coats. He's played by Adam Devine. And there's Judy, played by my guest Edie Patterson. On a show filled with some of the most talented people in comedy, Judy Gemstone is comfortably the funniest character. She's got a kind of crackly, manic energy, alternating between total confidence in everything she does and massive, crippling insecurity. She doesn't have much filter. She has a very, very short temper. I mean, so far in this season, she has destroyed an entire soda vending machine and an SUV. Here's a scene from early on in the show. In it, the Gemstone family gather at the gravestone of their late matriarch, Amy Lee. Goodman's Eli Gemstone has some harsh words for all of his children, including Judy. That was an embarrassment. <laughs> Don't laugh, Judy. I wasn't laughing at that, Daddy. I was just, I was recalling some funny vids I just saw of animals acting like fools. That's why I was laughing, so. I've heard you've had some company at your home. Who? Your little boyfriend and you've been shacking up. Daddy, he's my fiance, all right? He's not just my boyfriend, and BJ will be a gemstone soon enough. He ain't even a believer. Oh, well, yes, he no, is, he's not. Jesse. Amber showed me some posts he made on Facebook. Guess what, Daddy? They're pro abortion, so there's that. No, Daddy, they weren't. <laughs> yeah, BJ they does were. not like killing babies. Yeah. He likes little babies. No, I saw those posts too, Daddy. No, you didn't yeah, tell I did. me. Yeah. Very pro abortion. No, it was not, Daddy. And you know what? They won't give him a chance. That's what's happening. Why would we? He's a dud. He's a snooze. Yeah, you bring home a boring ass white boy to the family. Good mm. job. No, no. <laughs> he's an interesting ass white boy. The family <laughs> is lost. <laughs> Edie Patterson, welcome to Bullseye. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Jesse. And congratulations on this great show. I've gotten a lot of laughs out of it, a lot of laughs. Oh, good. I'm glad. Did you grow up going to church yourself? Yeah, I did. We were definitely at church every Sunday. And then if there was, you know, a thing during the week, like a covered dish supper or something, we went to that. And um, I was an acolyte, and we went to Sunday school, and none of it was uh, big mega churchy stuff. It was a small Episcopal church, but we were very, very involved. Which kind of Episcopal church was it? Because I'm a somewhat lapsed Episcopalian myself, and mm -hmm. I grew up in San Francisco where the priest in my church was gay in the like mid to late 80s. I don't think we ever had... A gay reverend, but I kind of knew through hearing about, um, you know, the bigger diocese, if that's what you call it, across the country, that, that Episcopals did have gay reverends. And I always, even from a small kid, thought, oh, good, we're in the good one. <laughs> 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 I knew from a very young age, like, this is like a cool philosophy of this church. This is what I think. Because even um, from the time I was really little, like the stuff that I got down with were, you know, the really basic stuff of, of old JC of like, he was down with everybody and it was all about being nice to everyone and he didn't care who had done bad things. And um, yeah, it it didn't deviate too far from my... Uh, my just, you know what? I probably got some of my thoughts about all of it from Sunday school of knowing, like, from very early on, 
you know, like there's no choosing to be gay. You're born gay or you're not. And like I probably, you know, inadvertently got a lot of that even from Sunday school without them even saying that stuff, you know. I feel like when I was going to church as a kid, and I don't know if this is an unusual experience, but I never hated church. I always thought church was nice, and I liked everyone at church, and I liked the church itself. And I ended up I ended up working in an Episcopal church for a few years um, and was thrilled to do so. I don't remember ever believing in God. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just thought church was nice, you know? I don't know. Oh, wow. So you never thought about, like, sort of the bigger picture of it? I mean, I thought about it, and I thought, yeah, I don't, I don't think I believe that. Wow. That's, that, does, that doesn't add up, add up to me, but, uh, you know, I was just was not a complainer, and everybody was being nice yeah. and everything. Like, you know, I think a lot of people who lose faith often lose faith in a cataclysmic way, you know, because mm-hmm. of some major disjuncture. But mm-hmm. for me, I, I was just always like, Hi, this is nice, but <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. I um I fully was all in like even to the point, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it probably there was probably a a good mix of fully believing and <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but and watching horror movies too early. <laughs> Because my dad really liked horror movies, so we saw, like, the craziest things at such a young age. And I still love horror movies. But I think back and I go, hmm, not sure if that was good or bad, but I love it. (laughs) Um, But I think it all kind of maybe tied in because I can remember phases as a kid of being, like, really worried about, like, you know, spiritual warfare type things and being super afraid of, like, the the ways in which like the devil could come for you and uh exorcism type stuff and uh it all kind of meshed in I was very much a believer but that like hardcore I guess kind of fear stuff definitely definitely uh dissipated thank god (laughs) like what awful stuff to like worry about as you're going to sleep as a child (laughs) like Hmm, wonder if I'll have to fight the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's so singing, so sad and scary. <laughs> what horror movies did you see at inappropriate ages as a kid? Oh, man. We saw, I can't remember if it was on a VHS tape. It must have been. We saw The Shining so young. How old are we? T- I mean, are we talking about, like, I saw The Shining in a high school class. With a hit cool with a cool teacher when I was like fifteen or sixteen, and I was like, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> this is too oh, much yeah, for yeah. me. No, I'm talking like, who? I feel like eight. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm not kidding. Like, we saw some crazy stuff. We did lean toward liking the ones that had kids in them, though. You know, like, I feel like there was a thing where it used to be you could have a genuinely scary movie. And it could have kids in it or a kid hero, like Silver Bullet. Do you know that movie? No. Oh, it's great. You got to check that out. Um, Or uh, Lost Boys isn't that scary. But like in that vein of like, oh, this is kind of for kids, but it's also very intense. We loved Silver Bullet. We loved The Shining. Um, I can remember seeing American Werewolf in London as a little kid. There was a, I didn't see this until college but there was uh there was a time when like a hurricane was coming through where I lived and my uh my family had come to my parents house because it was a little bit higher above sea level than their houses were and so everyone was like camped out in my house and I remember looking out the front window of like full trees and stuff flying past and in the other room for whatever reason the adults were watching the exorcist i think it was on regular tv or something because we didn't have cable and so it must have been just like on regular tv with like really bad parts cut out but still so scary and i remember just hearing that as i'm watching like a hurricane happen outside like horrible like ah. <laughs> So no wonder, like, it all kind of trips over into, like, religion sort of trips over into supernatural for me. One of the things that we see a lot of on the Righteous Gemstones is 
the father of the family's television program that he hosted with his wife. It's like a tele, like yeah. a, a, a late eighties, early nineties televangelist show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any Christian media in your life as a kid? Well, the closest we had to Christian media in our life was this isn't Christian media, but there would be like uh, reruns of the old Lawrence Welk show. And uh, <laughs> that would be on sometimes because my mom and dad thought it was um, funny and uh, interesting. And so I, I, as a result, did too. Um, but the other sort of uh, times it was on our TV were there was this. Uh, I don't know. I feel like it was like a tabloid news show called uh, A Current Affair. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes on A Current Affair, they would have stories about Jim Baker and Tammy Faye Baker. And so you would see like, you know, her crying or him apologizing into a microphone. And that that was about the extent of like megachurch stuff that I saw in my TV. But they always landed on me like they fascinated me so much because they were so overblown. I wanted them to come on. They were fascinating to me because it was almost like seeing um, an SNL character or something. Like, what is this real? What are they doing? You know? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that you see in the Righteous Gemstones that is really striking, I mean, at least if, if you're like me, a person who you know, doubts their every move and believes in nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Except for fearing the void. <laughs> is that these characters who are not necessarily evil so much as human behave with such extraordinary certitude. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, well, yeah, I guess I would behave that way too. If I thought that's what God wanted me to do, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's an ex that must be an extraordinary thing to play as an actor. It really is, and I think it's uh, it's really freeing. And then I think all of those things that you said of you know feeling emboldened by the Lord and like um, uh, blessed or special in a way, I think add that to uh, a certain amount of being born into opulence and being born into entitlement and wealth. And yeah, I think it, I think it would do weird things to your brain where even, even things that you may know are wrong. I think probably your brain flips it until you go like, yeah, but I can. <laughs> yeah. But you know, yeah, but I'm allowed to, because I feel it. Like I, what I feel is true. <laughs> Let's hear another scene from The Righteous Gemstones. And my guest is Edie Patterson, who plays uh, Judy Gemstone, the daughter of this family of megachurch evangelists. And in this scene, she's talking to her dad, played by John Goodman, and letting him know that, that she's not going to be at the Easter service. This is a fine time to be hearing about it, two hours before the service. I should have known better than to think I could count on you. Well, it's too little too late, Daddy. Because you know what they say, you can't gobble the pie if you didn't help bake it. Judy, what in the world has that man been putting in your head? Nothing, Daddy, OK? Nothing that wasn't already in there, because guess what? I'm not a little girl anymore. I'm a woman. Yeah, I know. You're almost 40 years old. Yeah, no duh, Daddy. That's called not a little girl anymore. I have regular woman panties where the string goes up my crack. I have I do sex. I'm carving my own path. Judy. That's my name. Don't wear it out, son. Happy Easter, Daddy. <laughs> this is a signature of Danny McBride, but it's at a, a Danny McBride's past work, but it's at a new level on this show. These very odd word choices, <laughs> like these <laughs> weird 25% to 40% wrong word choices like <laughs> gobble the pie yeah do you just like sit in the writer's room just like nope that word's not wrong enough nope that's words a little bit too wrong <laughs> it's more like if i see if i'm reading a scene danny wrote and something maybe looks in quotes wrong i know it's on purpose and 
it reads funny to me. And if I if I write a sentence like, "You can't gobble the pie if you didn't help bake it," if I you know if I'm making up phrases that don't exist but acting like they do exist and using words like gobble <laughs> and I show it to Danny and he laughs like I know like oh great we're we're on to something <laughs> we we weirdly um get each other that way and I'm oh god I'm so grateful for that <laughs> Danny McBride is a really unusual guy in Hollywood terms he's been on this show before and I've really enjoyed his past work he like Came out to Hollywood, flamed out, had to go back home, and then mm-hmm. ended up having extraordinary success. Yeah. The whole deal is an amazing story. He's such a bright dude. He's so effing smart and, um, yeah, so talented. I mean, it would, you know, it everything works out the way it's supposed to. When you started working with him as an actor, could you tell that it was the right thing, that it was a good match? Yeah, man, immediately. Like from the <clears throat> the second we started the first scene, it was immediate like very very obvious comedy chemistry and like I totally felt like he saw me and got me and I I totally saw and got him. I'd already been such a big fan of his stuff. What do you think it is about the two of you? I don't know. I think I think we find similar things funny. I think that we both like extreme specificity Mm -hmm. uh, in characters and uh, I think we both veer (laughs) veer toward the darkness with humor for sure there's like you know some kindred spirit brother sister stuff happening psychically um yeah I don't know exactly what it is we 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 think a lot of the same stuff is funny for sure we'll finish up my interview with Edie Patterson in just a bit After the break, if you're already a fan of The Righteous Gemstones, it's the moment you've been waiting for. We'll talk about Misbehavin', the profoundly catchy Christian country tune. She sings and helped write. We'll be running through the house with a pickle in our mouth in just a minute. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. Maddie Sofia here, host of Shortwave, a new daily science podcast from NPR. Listen for new discoveries, everyday mysteries, and the science behind the headlines, all in about 10 minutes. It'll be fun. You'll learn some stuff. And yeah, it's gonna get a little weird. Because science. Listen and subscribe now to Shortwave from NPR. Hi, I am Lori Kilmartin. And I'm Jackie Cation. Together, we host a podcast called... The Jackie and Lori Show. Uh, We're both stand-up comics... We recently met each other because women weren't allowed to work together on uh, on the road or in gigs for a long, long time. And so our friendship has been unfolding on this podcast for a couple of years. Jackie constantly works the road. I write for Conan and then I work the road in between. We do a lot of stand-up comedy and so we celebrate stand-up and we also bitch about it. We keep it to an hour. We don't have any guests. We somehow find enough to talk about every single week. So find us. You can subscribe to The Jackie and Lori Show at MaximumFun.com org or wherever you get your podcasts okay bye welcome back to bullseye i'm jesse thorne with me right now is edie patterson she's an actress and comedian a veteran of the groundlings in los angeles she currently plays judy gemstone on hbo's the righteous gemstones which is streaming now i'm really interested by the worlds of the various comedy training programs in L.A., New York, and Chicago that feed a lot of the comedy world. You were a groundling where the training is, it's long been a feeder for Saturday Night Live because a significant portion of the training is about developing distinctive comic characters. But you also have done a lot of narrative improv with a theater here in L.A. called Impro. That is something that there is not that much of. It you know it it has existed since the beginning of improv, but it is not a huge part of the world of improv these days. Improvising actual long form stories. How did you get into that? So yeah, I got I got involved with improv theater when I first moved to LA. Like when I first started taking classes at the Groundlings, but improv theater at the time was a different thing. It was a short form sort of more game based stuff called theater sports which is um comes from keith johnstone who's sort of one of the 
you know, original gurus of improv, English guy who started in, started his stuff in Canada. But theater sports was all trickled down from Keith Johnstone's philosophies. And so that's how I learned about improv, really, was through a Keith Johnstone t- style training. And then there was a certain point where L.A. theater sports became improv theater, I guess, maybe something like 10 years ago. And we started strictly improvising plays. And I still think we're a bit of an anomaly in that we we really do in earnest improvise a play. We we have um, sets, costumes. Uh, we do them at legit theaters like the Broad Stage in Santa Monica. And it's not played for jokes or goofiness. The shows are legitimately hilarious, but no one's ever trying to do jokes or one-liners or we're really just trying to make a, a cool story happen. So yeah, I, I've been with Impro Theater since the beginning and we do usually usually one genre at a time. We'll do a run, say at the, say at the Broad Stage in December, we'll do Improvise Jane Austen, Jane Austen Unscripted, and we'll do that for a few weeks. And um, so part of part of the the study at Impro Theater is very sort of scholarly in that we have to read a ton to all be on the same page because we're never doing that author or that style. Say we're doing Twilight Zone or we're doing Tennessee Williams or we're doing Chekhov. We have to study, study, study to know what that world is and then we'll do something in that world. It's never based on any play in particular. It just follows the rules of that, whatever that was, if that makes sense. Do you ever have the experience of losing yourself in improv, like almost the way that a, you know, a, an athlete describes might, might describe losing themselves in, you know, running back and forth on a soccer field? Absolutely. To me, that's when it's that's when it's the best. When maybe someone from the audience is talking to you after, and they are like, "Oh my God, when this happened and this happened," and you really don't know what they're talking about. You need them to tell you what happened because you have no recollection. That happens a lot in, I do this improvised one person show sometimes where I play all the characters. This woman who is is a Groundlings alum from, uh, I think she was a Groundling in the 80s, 90s, and now she directs there. Her name's Deanna Oliver. She came up with this concept called One, and it's an improvised one person show. And when I've done it, I usually play between, I don't know, 12 and 20 characters. And you just go and you hope, you hope that you can just wipe the whiteboard in your head clean and then channel something. And thank God, I'm, I'm knocking some wood right now. That is what happens if you let it. But absolutely, I feel like I go out of body. I feel like I'm there with other people, if that makes sense. And I count on them. They're all me, <laughs> but I count on them like I would someone in, an, in a scene I'm improvising with. And I feel like I'm there with them. It's, it's, that one is the weirdest. And I've felt that channeling thing in other shows too, but that one is so, so visceral of like you, something just happens and you go somewhere. How do you think that working in long form narrative improv affected your work as a writer oh it's it's huge they so inform each other because that's how ideas come in almost in a on an improv track they almost come in sideways i'll have a sideways idea of going oh that's funny that's funny if that if that character thinks that and then i'll just follow that track like i would if i was improvising and many times it's I find myself, you know, either talking to myself or talking with Danny or if he says something riffing on it. And yeah, so much, so much of my writing will uh, spring in some way from improv, for sure, for sure. I have to ask you about a song that you helped write (laughs) for The Righteous Gemstones. This is, you know, I will mention who's coming on the show on Twitter and the universal interest of our audience was this song (laughs) it's a song called misbehaving can you tell me a little bit about what where how this falls in the show yeah so 
The song first shows up audibly in episode five. There's in episode three, you see you're at baby Billy's house at Freeman's Gap and you walk past an album on the wall of he and Amy Lee as kids. And it says, you know, baby Billy and Amy Lee misbehaving. And you just sort of walk by it. And uh, and then in episode five, the, all of episode five is a flashback to 1989. And they they perform the song together, the whole song. And it's man, oh, man, it's great. They're both so, so good. So good at doing it. Both uh, grew up clogging, I have to mention. Um, and that song was brought up when we were writing the episodes John, one of the writers, had said, had, we knew they had a, a hit song, and he had uh, just named it Misbehavin. And so through the scripts, that would be brought up, you know, Misbehavin. Oh, they, you know, their hit Misbehavin, blah, blah, blah. And then it came the time when Misbehavin needed to actually exist as a song because it was going to be performed. And Danny had the first couple of lines in his head and I can't remember if there was a melody with them I think there might have been but he sang the first couple of lines in the room just as a joke and they they made me laugh really hard and they and I understood something about him saying those first two lines made me go like oh it's like that and so then that inspired me and I wrote um, a whole chunk after that more of the song and, um, you know, added in the little, uh, the element of how do we bring religion into this and added in like met the man in the thorny crown stuff. And so we had this whole big chunk of it and a melody had shown up through he and I talking about it. And so I sang it into his phone <laughs> up at Rough House and we sent it to Joey Stevens and the music supervisor and Joey Stevens then added um, another verse or two and added like all this awesome instrumentation and, in my opinion, added the funniest line of the song and the most <laughs> enigmatic line of the song, running through the house with a pickle in my mouth. <laughs> and, <Yes>. uh, <laughs> and sent it back. And I don't know, it was perfect. It was. It just was immediately so... Sticky and fun, and we kind of knew we were onto something cool because Danny had taken like our rough, our rough cut of it, just the very, very initial, like uh, all the stuff in one, or maybe he even took that voice memo, something he played for his kids, and the kids were immediately into it, and I don't know, that sort of showed us like, oh, that's weird. There's something about that beat of it that is um. I don't almost kind of hits on a primal level. Let's say it slaps. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was really, really fun. And uh, once he said that stuff, of like Mama told me not, Mama told me not to. I did it anyway, Miss B. Haven. The, I don't know. It, it just like opened a portal in my mind, and I was like, Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> and then yeah, just each thing added on to each thing, and then we had a song. Let's hear Misbehaving from The Righteous Gemstones. Mama told me not to, I did it anyway, Misbehaving. Daddy said don't, but I said I'm gonna misbehaving. I was on a window seal swimming in the creek. Got your crawdads and playing with a stick. I wore lipstick. And I got caught shaving. Just two, two little country kids, kids outside misbehaving. misbehaving. We thought we was just messing around. Got to write a clogging break into all the songs. Had you even written a song before? Yeah, I have written songs before. I uh, I was part of this. I have I've written them for you know stuff of the Groundlings, and then I was also part of this uh, uh, musical parody of the Lord of the Rings a chunk of time ago, and I co-wrote songs for that. So I like writing songs. I I haven't I can't read music or anything, but uh, I like writing songs and I like making up melodies and stuff. Did you? tour your musical parody of the lord of the rings were you taking it 
Decepticons or anything? Yeah, we started it as this thing we were going to do, I think, I think for like a month of weekends, like four weekends or something. And then the response was crazy. So we ran it for at least six months straight in LA. And then we did it at Comic-Con and it was crazy. We did it at this giant theater in San Diego and everyone came in costume and it was so fun. And it got real culty. And then because it was getting cool and because they... A a big uh, dramatic Lord of the Rings musical was about to be released in the West End. So we got the cease and desist because ours was getting kind of popular. And then we stopped and then... I think that didn't do well or something. And then they were back interested in our show. And then we then we were legal and with, you know, signed on with uh, the people who owned all the rights to the books. And then um, I did it. We did it for two weeks in New York once as the as part of the New York Musical Festival. And yeah, we did it a few different places. I mean, that is wild. I had no idea. Like the, the fact that you got a license to do it at some point is extraordinary to me because I know about my friend Jonathan Colton, who's one of the hosts of NPR's Ask Me Another, is a musician with a deep geek fan base. And he'll play a con and I'll be like, oh, how did that con go, Jonathan? And he'll be like, it was great. There was 10,000 people at my show. (laughs) And I'll be like, what? What? (laughs) I mean, he's wonderful. He deserves 10,000 people at his show. But there is... Like, the culture is so deep and strong of yes. geekdom that yeah. it is really amazing when something kind of rides that lightning. Like, when you get into the slipstream of that, it's kind of an amazing thing. Especially, I imagine, if you're, you know, if you're used to doing uh, long-form improv in a 50-seat theater. Yeah, I mean, we were, all of us who... uh worked on this thing were improvisers all of the original cast and so yeah we all co-wrote the songs and um yeah it was a crazy thing it was a crazy thing for for a bunch of improvisers and we all kind of were into that stuff anyway so it was yeah it was amazing and that slipstream feeling is the exact perfect way to describe it of all of a sudden you're like part of a thing that people come in come to in capes you know (laughs) (laughs) like Boom, one day to the next. It's a giant crowd of people in capes. (laughs) You had a long career in all of the types of comedy where you almost can't make a living. (laughs) Into your mid-30s, or at least early 30s. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, if you're you're a moderately successful stand-up comic... You can work the road. You know, you don't have to be a famous stand-up comic to make a living being a stand-up comic. But when you're doing Mm -hmm. sketch and improv, there's, you know, 30 theater jobs at, you know, the Second City in in Chicago and the Second City cruise ship or whatever. And Mm -hmm. there's, you know, 30 jobs on Saturday Night Live and there's being in TV commercials and stuff. And, like, you have had extraordinary success at a point in your career where many people might have bailed. And I wonder if you considered bailing as you had the kind of medium success that in sketch and improv particularly can make it hard to, you know, just pay rent and eat. You know... Okay, to answer part of your question, no, I I never thought about bailing because I always felt like I was moving forward and I always knew, I don't know, I just knew this, I knew this was what I was supposed to be doing and I knew, and I knew I was good at it and the thing is I never thought like, oh, I need a sketch job because I, I just happened to be uh, an actor who is an improviser who has done sketch at the Groundlings. You know what I mean? I never thought like, oh boy, I better find a sketch job. Right. Um, so, yeah, and then there's, you know, there's all those 
those jobs that sort of propel you and push you forward, but maybe like the world doesn't know they're happening yet. Like uh, when you get a commercial and that, you know, pays for you to live for a while or when you do a pilot that doesn't get picked up or when you do, uh, you know, 10 episodes of something that just happened to be that no one watched or, you know what I mean? I, I always felt like I was moving forward and I'm I'm not saying like it didn't get scary or existential at times, but I always, I always just kind of knew like I have something cool that is specifically me and I, I just, uh, I don't know. I just always knew that it was going to be good. Well, Edie, thank you so much for being on Bullseye and thanks for your awesome work. I've gotten so many laughs out of it. Oh, I'm glad, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Edie Patterson. The Righteous Gemstones is wrapping up its first season right now. Don't worry. Danny and Edie and everyone else are already hard at work on season two. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is produced at MaximumFun.org World Headquarters, overlooking MacArthur Park in beautiful Los Angeles, California, where my producer Kevin has noted the question of the week, can pigeons swim? Have you been doing research into that, Kevin? He says no. He has not been doing research into that. Just to, just something that he's been he's been mulling over while he looks out the window. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien, and our production fellow is Jordan Cowling. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team, thanks to them and to their label, Memphis Industries, for letting us use it. And we have two decades of past Bullseye interviews. You can find them all at MaximumFun.org. Like, uh, let's say we talked about Danny McBride and how great he is. He was on Bullseye. Find it at MaximumFun.org. We're also on YouTube. Uh, All the interviews from this week's program are up there if you want to share them with somebody or post them to social media or, or whatever. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. You can keep up with the show there as well. All of our past episodes also available in your favorite podcast app. And I guess that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.